Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, when giving this uh, title to my presentation, I was a little bit uh, in doubt because uh, when I, I uh, talked about this uh, to my students, they didn't know this expression. So they were completely baffled by, by the, this allegory. They didn't know it. So I will just uh, talk about uh, one aspect of uh, global climate change, because uh, in the past I had uh, several talks about uh, a more general uh, approach to, to this issue. Uh, OK, let's start with uh, some basic uh, facts uh, regarding the state of uh, the atmosphere in particular its composition. And this is a rather peculiar representation of, uh, of uh, atmospheric composition because in the, in the school, uh, students normally learn about uh, percentage uh, composition of the atmosphere. But this, is, uh, uh, this uh, table shows the, the absolute amount of, uh, of the at main atmospheric main and, uh, and uh, trace atmospheric constituents. It shows that this is a rather large uh, uh, atmospheric uh, uh, volume and mass, of course. But which is more important is that it uh, suffered tremendous change since the Industrial Revolution. And if we look at the third column of this table, then we see that even the amount of oxygen has been reduced by uh, measurable uh, amount, uh, and also the amount of ozone, which uh, is a crucial component in uh, in uh, the Earth's uh, bio, uh, life, uh, has been reduced considerably. But uh, uh, in the context of climate change, we most often uh, quote uh, the increase in the concentration of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, which was which were increased uh, considerably. And uh, these atmospheric changes are the primary causes of, uh, of, of those changes that are observed in the atmosphere. Regarding uh, uh, the concept that uh, underlines uh, climate change, it was established on, uh, on the first uh, World Conference on Global Climate in, in Geneva, Switzerland, in, uh, in 19... 79, and it was the, the year when uh, satellite measurements of, uh, of uh, most uh, uh, Earth's uh, phenomenon started. So it, we, we didn't know at that time, not me because I didn't know anything. I was just uh, in, my, in primary school, but uh, scientists uh, didn't know much about uh, the changes uh, that, uh, that uh, we, we we know uh, today. And uh, this uh, conference uh, just articulated uh, some uh, simple approach to make uh, people aware of, uh, of the potential changes that will uh, likely happen. And this was uh, the introduction of the greenhouse concept, which turned out to be not uh, very useful for understanding the basic processes of, of climate change. And this greenhouse concept uh, uh, accompanied with uh, the key parameter, this uh, is global mean temperature, which doesn't mean anything. I mean, it's just a derived parameter. It doesn't exist. You cannot measure directly uh, global mean temperature. And from this two approach, from this uh, concept, it followed that uh, global warming becomes a kind of expectation, like uh, in a greenhouse or or a car in a car left on on the sun. But uh, if if this concept would uh, be so simple, then we would expect then uh, we would expect uh, a quite a uniform increase in global temperature, since uh, greenhouse gases are well mixed in the atmosphere, homogeneously distributed in the atmosphere, and its effect is is about the same at uh, on different uh, locations of the world. So if we just rely on uh, greenhouse effects and greenhouse gases, then we would expect a ki kind of uniform warming all around the globe. But what we observe instead is a rather uh, non-uniform uh, uh, 
pattern of warming, which is shown here in a representation showing uh, temperature, uh, most recent temperatures versus uh, the average temperature of the middle of the, of the second part of the 20th century. And this representation, the red colors means, uh, represents uh, an increase of four degrees. Yellow is about two, and, uh, and white is nothing, and blue is uh, cl some cooling. So we, sh we, we just see from this uh, map that there is no uniform warming of the globe. There is very pronounced warming at uh, high latitudes in the north and, uh, and relatively less uh, in the southern part, southern hemisphere. And what is the reason for such a, a non-uniform uh, warming pattern is that uh, the greenhouse representation is turned out uh, to be uh, a imperfect representation of the processes that are taking place on, on Earth. A more uh, realistic uh, pro, uh, model uh, would be just uh, think of a, of a cocktail uh, containing uh, ice cubes. And this, is, this uh, model is a more realistic uh, uh, model for the Earth because Earth contains water. Actually, two-thirds of, of the Earth's surface is covered by oceans and uh, contains uh, ice on the poles and on uh, high altitude, at a high altitude. So uh, this is a more re uh, realistic representation how the Earth, Earth uh, how the globe uh, is uh, affected. And if uh, I present this uh, model to school children uh, and I ask them uh, what uh, changes they uh, would expect if uh, we expose this system to to energy, to heat, then all school children can tell that the first phenomenon and most spectacular phenomenon of, 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 uh, of the change will be the melting of, of ice. They would not expect uh, the air temperature in this uh, beaker to increase. They, they didn't, tell, didn't tell me about that. They just said that uh, ice will melt. So we have to focus on ice because it's a kind of indicator of of the changes that are happening on Earth, and regarding the uh, the changes in the in the, in the, the cryosphere, the uh, ice on the on the poles, especially on the North Pole, that we are witnessing uh, a, a very uh, significant reduction in in the volume and the, the aerial extent of the ice. Actually, we we would st uh, state that uh, ice. Uh, Sea ice, especially because it's the most vulnerable part of the cryosphere in, uh, in the Arctic Ocean, it's actually collapsing. So it's, uh, if you uh, look at uh, the two figures, uh, the first one uh, was taken uh, in 1984, it's uh, just 30 years ago, showing the uh, summer, late summer extent, uh, aerial extent of the sea ice uh, over the Arctic Ocean, and the uh, other uh, left-hand uh, figure was taken in, tw uh, in uh, 2012, uh, 30 years later, less than 30 years later, and there is a reduction by 40% between the two. So ice extent, late summer ice extent, was reduced by 40% within 30 years. These are uh, in uh, geological changes over very short time scale. That uh, those, uh, this uh, rate of uh, decrease is unprecedented in, in, uh, the, in uh, the history of the Earth. So this is really a very pronounced uh, change that uh, can be uh, witnessed. And uh, this is easy to observe because uh, there are satellites already on orbit uh, and looking at, uh, at uh, the status of ice uh, from a geostationary orbit. And uh, we can uh, monitor the changes that are happening in the cryosphere uh, daily. So we have daily uh, information on, on, the, on the status of ice. <coughs> 
And if we put these uh, changes into the context of, uh, of uh, a little bit uh, uh, over a, a time span of uh, 1,500 years, then we see that these uh, changes in the cryosphere are really were, uh, abrupt and uh, unprecedented. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the data from the past are uh, proxies, are uh, just a reconstruction from uh, geochemical and, and uh, other observations, but these are uh, quite reliable. There are kind of a uh, range of uncertainty which is shown here in this uh, gray uh, shaded area. But uh, all, apart from this, we see a uh, pronounced uh, drop in the volume in the, in the area of the uh, sea ice uh, over the Arctic. But there is another uh, process that is not seen from the space. This is the, how uh, the thickness of uh, sea ice changed over the past 40 years. And this, uh, these observations are relatively recent because nobody, in the past, nobody dared to go under the ice, uh, in the sea ice in the Arctic. Now, uh, nowadays, there, it, there are many possibilities to make these measurements, either from the satellites, geophysical measurements, or from under by drones. So nobody has to uh, uh, risk their, uh, his life to go under the ice. Uh, and they can make the measurements. And these measurements shows that the, ice, the thickness of sea ice, uh, the average thickness of sea ice over the Arctic Ocean just halved uh, within 40 years. So from starting from four meters uh, in average, and now it's about two meters. So if we combine the aerial reduction with, uh, with the thickness reduction, then we just uh, come to the conclusion that 70% of the volume of ice or mass of ice, sea ice, disappeared within 40 years. So this is a tremendous change given that uh, there are several thousands, uh, tens of thousands cubic kilometers of ice, sea ice, over the Arctic. So the uh, ice covers more, more than 10 million square kilometers over the Arctic, so we are talking about tens uh, of uh, thousands of uh, cubic, kilome cubic kilometers of ice. So it's an Im immense volume of ice that uh, has been disappearing uh, recently. Okay, why, how can uh, such a large uh, and robust uh, environmental uh, compartment uh, lose uh, so much uh, within uh, a few decades? And uh, the reason for this is not uh, just uh, in, in the uh, triggering effect of uh, increasing greenhouse gases and other, but also uh, uh, a po positive feedback that is uh, linked to the physical uh, behavior of ice, and this is uh, called uh, positive feedbacks, which are kind of reinforcing mechanism that helped accelerate uh, processes that uh, was uh, initiated by any other external factor. And the, the most uh, well-known feedback is the albedo, albedo feedback, which uh, is briefly that uh, when ice surface uh, starts to shrink, then exposes more uh, surface uh, to a dark uh, surface of water. And the radiation, solar radiation, is absorption of solar radiation is increased when, when uh, ice is replaced with uh, with the water, which means that more energy is absorbed, solar energy, which means that the temperature is increasing there, which also uh, feed back, feeds back to a red further reduction of ice surface. It's a kind of uh, uh, accelerating and uh, reinforcing mechanism that is very effective. That actually, that was the underlying mechanism uh, in uh, the Pleistocene uh, in the variations of uh, interglaciers and, uh, and glacial periods. That was the main factor behind these uh, variations. But these were more, much, more, much slower than the processes that we observe today. And there are additional feedbacks which are 
uh, less known but also important. So th this is how uh, uh, how ice looks like uh, looks like uh, in the middle of Greenland, in the mid middle of nowhere, when it is expected to be bright, white, pure, and uh, very uh, clear. And instead, it looks like uh, some dirty snow uh, in in uh, in the city. And actually, this is not really uh, not only atmospheric pollution that deposited on, on the surface of snow, which also happens and uh, contributes to the darkening of snow, which also kind of has an albedo effect, the same way as uh, the disappearance of ice. But uh, there are these uh, atmospheric deposition, for example, uh, smoke from, from forest fires, provide nutrients for algae and increase temperature, increase radiation, absorb radiation, and nutrients from the smoke of forest fires fuel the bloom of algae, uh, which uh, uh, cry cryoalgae that has color and that they have, uh, they just reduce the reflectivity of ice and adding extra energy to, to vast surfaces. So this is a kind of uh, process that can be observed recent, uh, in recent years, and this is uh, very thoroughly stu studied, and this, uh, it, this uh, looks to be accelerating. And the other uh, feedback is increasing temperature and uh, changing conditions in, uh, over the Arctic Circle causes uh, uh, more uh, boreal forests. This year was uh, an excellent example of uh, uh, vast boreal forest in far uh, in the uh, north in the Arctic Circle, over the Arctic Circle, and these forest fires uh, contribute to pollution, contribute to dark deposition of dark dark soot, to nutrients, to algae. So these these contribute to uh, a kind of a feedback mechanism for the acceleration of these processes. Actually, the uh, frequency and, uh, and uh, the area uh, e exposed uh, to forest fires or, or consumed by forest fires was increased, was quadrupled during the, uh, the last two decades. So uh, both in, in uh, Canada, in si Siberia, and also in, in uh, Scandinavia. Four, it increased by, uh, by a factor of four. Uh, since uh, uh, the turn of the millennium. Okay, and there are additional mechanisms which are just uh, starting to, to show up, and these are a potential uh, greenhouse uh, emission from uh, the sowing of permafrost. Permafrost means the frozen ground, frozen soil, which covers a pretty large area over the, around the circle, Arctic Circle, and these are just uh, melting. Uh, there, it, uh, the, the permafrost uh, boundary moved uh, uh, 80 kilometers northward, exposing a large area to sowing, and these uh, permafrost contains a lot of uh, carbon that was just isolated from the atmosphere because the soil was frozen, but when it thaws, it just uh, li li liberates uh, uh, carbon stored in, in the permafrost and let, uh, let uh, it uh, directly uh, enter to the atmosphere, contributing to greenhouse effect by emitting methane and uh, carbon dioxide. And also uh, liberating some of the viruses and microbiology microbiology that was just frozen for thousands of years in, in, in the permafrost. So there, there were also examples of, of that sort of danger from, from this process. Okay, but uh, finally just have a look at why Arctic ice is uh, so important. I would say it's globally important because we, yeah. So it's my last slide, so I will keep this. <laughs> okay. so. Because uh, one might think that this is just a local phenomenon, it, it is just uh, influencing uh, uh, people living there or, or polar bears or some uh, 
some species uh, far in the north, but actually it's uh, Arctic ice is more important than it, it seems to be at the first sight because uh, um, this large volume of ice is a key parameter in, uh, in atmospheric dynamics in the northern hemisphere. So atmospheric circulation in the northern hemisphere relies on the state on the status of ice because many uh, phenomenon atmospheric uh, circulation uh, starts from far in the north they just originate there and then move southward eastward by all these atmospheric processes so it's kind of uh, air conditioning of the northern hemisphere is the volume of ice up far in the north so it's a uh, also affect it's a uh, change of status also affects uh, lower latitudes and perhaps it has a global impact uh, as we, ha we see it in the other uh, aspect that this area far in the north is very close to the area where the engine of the global oceanic circulation operates. So there is uh, the it's the Labrador Sea, actually, when there is a kind of, uh, of uh, downwelling uh, of uh, surface uh, currents, oceanic currents, and then uh, the, this is actually the driving force for the whole conveyor belt, the great oceanic conveyor belt that carries heat and carries energy and, uh, and uh, nutrients all through the world ocean. So this is really a critical point. There are only two drivers, two engines of the whole oceanic circulation, is and one is just very close to to the to the Arctic Ocean, where where the ice is located. So what we can uh, state uh, based on these uh, the importance of Arctic ice in the global climate is that we we are exposing ourselves to a potentially disruptive climate change. If something happens, for example, with oceanic circulation, for example, it stops, then it, it would, would just cause a global transformation, a very abrupt transformation of, uh, of uh, uh, the global climate that, as we uh, currently know. And this, uh, according to model, physical models, this uh, 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 disruption can happen within a few months. So this whole oceanic conveyor belt can stop within a few months and takes thousands of years to regenerate. So it's really a danger that, that uh, the loss of ice, this, uh, this uh, high rate of, uh, of ice loss will cause some uh, disruptive climate change uh, in the future. This is not a kind of prophecy because uh, I think our understanding is limited to predict when and how these, these changes will happen, but this is a physically feasible uh, process that can happen in, in, in the future. So I think that we have, uh, we have risked a lot by changing the conditions that we get used to. Uh, uh, over the globe, and that will have uh, profound uh, social and, uh, and economic uh, consequences. So I kept the time, I guess, so thank you for your attention.